hope. Rebellions are built on hope. It was Lucasfilm's first attempt to make a Star Wars film that wasn't part of a main trilogy, a side story, even though it's really a prologue to the very first Star Wars movie. Look Ma, no Jedi, here's a movie forever doomed to be misspelled by typing too fast. Light it up. Rogue One. <laughs> It's a peaceful life. It's lonely, I imagine. Since Lyra died, yes. Oh, look, here's Lyra back from the dead. It's a miracle. When Disney took Star Wars off George Lucas's hands for a knockdown price of lots of money, they had their eyes on releasing a new trilogy of films with a new entry every two years. In between the mainline films, the plan was to release side stories in the Star Wars universe. That was the initial plan anyway. That is a bad idea. I think so, and so does Cassin. The first of these side stories was Rogue One, a film that would feature no Jedi, a film that would tell, if not a standalone story, one that would at least tell a standalone backstory. Industrial light and magic FX guru John Knoll had pitched an idea to his bosses about dramatising some of the background events leading up to Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope, namely how Princess Leia came to be racing to Tatooine to find Obi-Wan Kenobi with an Imperial cruiser tailgating her ship like an angry BMW driver. Sorry, that should just read BMW driver. Let's see how the Rebellion got the plans to the Death Star. By the way, don't get too attached to any of the new characters because this is a film where almost every single character featured will die on screen at some point, whether it's in this movie or not. <laughs> Rogue One tries a few different things. Firstly, it's not a purely linear story with time jumps and flashbacks galore. And there's an attempt at a more in-depth backstory for the main characters who are set up with detailed histories and complex personal motivations so that you can come to know them and enjoy their adventures for years to come in multiple, yeah, well maybe not. Jin Erso is someone that grew up trying to keep a healthy distance from both the Empire and the Rebellion. In the Star Wars universe, that's easier said than done. Like Evil Knievel jumping 14 buses while driving a golf cart with a 25% charge. Galen Erso is an important Imperial scientist, vital to the creation of the Death Star, but he's left that behind to become a farmer with his wife and his daughter, Jin. The Imperials, led by Krennic, need him to return to the project. You're confusing peace with terror. Well, we have to start somewhere. Years later, Jin has grown up, having been raised by troublemakers and become a troublemaker herself. She's a loose cannon. On your own from the age of 15, reckless, aggressive and undisciplined. But the Rebel Alliance needs her help in order to get close to extremist rebel Saw Gerrera, who thanks to Imperial defector Bodhi has a message from Jin's father. Meanwhile, director Krennic is involved with a power struggle with Tarkin. Ben Mendelsohn's Krennic is a good look at why people join the Imperials. They themselves are ambitious and power-hungry sociopaths, with no regard for anyone but themselves, which makes them a barrel of laughs when it comes time for Secret Santa. Working for the Empire, there is actually plenty of scope for advancement because of all of the high staff turnover rate, because of, you know, colleagues getting shot, blown up, strangled, etc. You could try calling in the Occupational Health and Safety Troopers, but I believe they were the first to die when they were inspecting all those catwalks without railings and fell off after being caught in a gust of wind. Cassian Andor is tasked with retrieving Galen Erso with Jin's help, despite her reluctance to get involved with the Rebellion. Life in the Rebellion also has plenty of scope for advancement thanks to being killed, captured, etc. Apparently, Galen Erso has left a small weakness in the Death Star, but rather than tell them where this small weakness is, he uses his remaining talk time to tell his daughter that he loves her. The ancient Jedi town of Jeddah is destroyed by a test firing of the Death Star's newly installed main cannon. But even so, the Empire is not ready to admit the existence of the Death Star. So, they cover it up as a mining disaster, but it's thankfully one that won't inspire a song by the Bee Gees. After a botched mission to capture or kill Urso, the deadlocked rebel leaders leave it to Jin to organise her own suicide mission to retrieve the Death Star plants, to try and find out what the hell this weak point is. Thanks, Dad. If we use this attractive Death Star themed cheese board, we can see the deadly weakness here, near the cheese plane useful for cutting thin slices of Havarti. One neatly placed provolone torpedo will set off a chain reaction that will destroy the entire cheese board, I mean battle station. If we can make it to the ground, we'll take the next chance, and the next, on and on until we win, or well, the chances are spent. So off they go in a Dirty Dozen-esque commando mission along with a few new friends. What's your call sign, pilot? Rogue? Rogue one. 
Bodhi, apparently a pilot, the double team of the force-sensitive guardians of the wills, the blind monk Chirrut, and his offsider Bays. Are you kidding me? I'm blind! And of course there's Andor's back-chatting droid, the reprogrammed Imperial droid K2SO. There are a lot of explosions for two people blending in. The attack on Scarif is exciting and fun, but it's the sort of plot a programmer would come up with in order to explain why retrieving some files and uploading it to the Rebels is such a colossal pain in the ass. One by one our heroes fall, and they all get a very poignant death scene, which is a little bit moot because even if they hadn't have died, they'd have been vaporised in a bit anyway. Jin manages to get the data, transmit it and escape the Imperial base with Andor just as the Death Star fires its main gun on its lowest setting. Why the Imperials would want to destroy their own look at me, I'm trying to rationalise a movie plot. Bless. Jin and Cassian see the shockwave approaching and embrace, perhaps to comfort each other in their final moments, but also Cassian is probably wondering whether he should tell her about the TV show they're doing about him. Maybe he should just keep that to himself at eh, too late. The film goes from detailing some background mentioned in Star Wars A New Hope into a literal prologue and shows the rebel blockade runner leaving the scene with the plans on board, but not before Darth Vader goes apeshit on some rebel troops. He must have really tuckered himself out with all of this because when we next see him, he seems out of breath and very happy for the stormtroopers to take point. Like every prequel, every I is dotted and every T is crossed, but at the same time, the page seems to have been turned upside down so that everything no longer neatly dovetails. Despite the film having dispatched all of the leads and the supporting characters, digital Princess Leia delivers the message of the film. Hope. Hope in that future digital doubles will be less distracting. Hope that other Star Wars films will also make a billion dollars. Hope that future Star Wars films wouldn't have their directors sidelined. Well, wonder how that worked out. Rogue One sounded like it could have been two hours of unoriginal fan servers trotted out cheaply for a quick buck. Instead we got the story of a bunch of tragic heroes getting blown up in sequence, like sequenced explosives in a building demolition. Whenever one of them manages to do their thing to progress the mission, boom, they're gone. I got the sense that one of the scriptwriters had been renovating a house and used the script to work through their frustration with organising the schedules of building contractors and tradespeople. After Bodhi installs the electrical wiring, boom. Chirrut pulls up the walls, boom. Baze cleans up the dust, boom. K2SO installs the doors, boom. He's telling people they're making a weapon. The Kyber crystals, that's what they're for. What kind of weapon? Look, I have to go. What kind of weapon? A planet killer! Gareth Edwards had previously directed a few effects heavy films, including the 2014 Godzilla movie, and brought a different sensibility to a Star Wars film. Writer Gary Witter had written the first draft of the script, Chris Weitz also wrote versions of the script, with Bourne movie writer-director Tony Gilroy credited as a co-writer, but he was brought in to oversee some fairly intensive reshoots that changed elements of the film. This mix of creative visions doesn't negatively impact the final film, though you can see elements of Edward's notionally more improvisational working method in some of the original trailers. As to what's really that different from the original cut and the theatrical release, details are sketchy, like the story of how I acquired a certificate to become a ship's master. Uh, starboard is down, right? The film's ending was restructured to tighten up the action, build up some of the lesser characters, and areas condensed so all of the walking and running shots in the teaser weren't needed. Jin's interactions with other rebels were also tweaked and reshot. You did? But I thought it was boring and you were in trouble. Making a Star Wars film is hard on the directors, which is why Lucasfilm has an army of them in reserve. It's not perhaps the deepest bench and we should be thankful they never got down to Michael Bay. Though I suspect a Michael Bay Star Wars film would have just been two hours of this. We have a film that doesn't give a lot to its minor characters, but at the same time, we do have a film that's almost as tight as a drum. My beloved. So much of my life has been wasted. The relationship between Jin and her father Galen Erso drives everything. So yes, as it's been said many, many times, it's another Star Wars film built around daddy issues. Felicity Jones gives us a lead character who starts the film wanting to run away from everyone and is kind of forced into helping the rebels, discovers her father is not the monster she thought he'd become and finds a purpose in life a bit late. You give way to an enemy this evil with this much power and you condemn the galaxy to an eternity of submission. The time to fight is now! Diego Luna as Cassian Andor begins as a guy who finds killing has become way too easy for his liking. We'll be alright. Hmm? 
he takes on the mission to recover Gale and Urso. Forget what you heard in there. There will be no extraction. You find him, you kill him. Any attack on Scarif is a desperate bid, but otherwise the rebellion is just a bunch of people standing around staring awkwardly at each other. <coughs> Forrest Whitaker is Saw Gerrera, Jin's estranged mentor, playing a borderline psychotic rebel extremist. Did you come here to kill me? Ben Mendelsohn is by far my favourite Imperial villain, at least until this point. We stand here amidst my achievement, not yours! Director Krennic tries to play the Imperial system for his own advancement, but finds his career path has a few speed bumps that he has to deal with. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations. Riz Ahmed is the pilot Bodhi. And I gave it to them, they did not find it. I gave it. Donnie Yen's Chirrut isn't even a Jedi or able to see. It's your foot, all right. Yet in combat schools most of the Jedi we've seen to date. His mate Wen Jiang just blasts everything with his backpack vacuum cleaner slash machine gun. No Jedi here anymore. Only dreamers like this fool. Mads Mikkelsen is a loving father, having to smile and play nice and eat shit while working for the Empire, while at the same time sabotaging the Death Star. I made myself indispensable, and all the while, I laid the groundwork for my revenge. We call it the Death Star. And Alan Tudyk voices K2SO. Maybe we should leave target practice behind. Are you talking about me? K2SO, a reprogrammed Imperial droid, isn't quite a replacement for HK-47, the rather blunt murder bot from the video game Knights of the Old Republic. But he does get a few laughs here and there, and pretty much is the film's main source of humour. He is taking us to the quiet! <laughs> And there's a fresh one if you mouth off again. Like most people providing voiceovers for Star Wars characters, Alan Tudyk is perhaps a bit wasted in the role. Unless, of course, they paid him in the film's failed to tie in Jin Erso Jin, in which case perhaps he actually was wasted. It's high. Other people had scored some of the lesser Star Wars projects, but this was the first major Star Wars not to have a score written by John Williams. Alexandra Desplat had originally been penciled in to create the music, but dropped out in favour of Michael Giacchino, the man who scores everything on planet Earth. His score occasionally quotes Williams' score, but he's managed to give you an original Star Wars soundtrack. However, it is perhaps disappointing that we didn't get a pop song compilation, Songs Inspired by Rogue One. It's still a story that's adjacent to major events, so of course, pre-existing characters appear. I mean, where would a Star Wars movie be without these two popping up? Why does nobody ever tell me anything, Artu? Mon Mothma appears, again played by Genevieve O'Reilly, where she would be a major character in the prequel TV series. Even Melchie, who later, for us, but earlier, for them, would escape from prison with Cassian Andor. Jimmy Smits appears as Bail Organa, and Peter Cushing had long since departed, so having a digital overlay is a mixed bag. Tarkin is impressive, but the uncanny valley, that feeling you get when something is very realistic but not quite realistic enough, is not something the film totally overcomes. The same applies to digital Carrie Fisher. Again, impressive use of the technology, but there's still some ways to go. It's not far off the day where many classic actors will appear in films now reduced to a digital file. I'm far when ready. Of course, not a digital double, Darth Vader, and he appears in a few scenes where we briefly see his citadel on Mustafa. At the end, his utter wrecking of rebel troops is a joy to behold, but it's pretty much the only time in the franchise we've ever seen him this energetic. Maybe it is time to cut back on the Red Bull Darth baby. James Earl Jones returned to provide Vader's voice. The universe here is designed to be exactly like that of the original trilogy, particularly the installation on Scarif, but at the same time we get variations on the technology, weapons, costumes and vehicles. Rogue One is a great looking film with varied locations and not one shot of bloody Tatooine, not even a postcard. The film does a pretty good job of giving us a look at the state of the galaxy, its technology and politics just a teeny bit before the start of A New Hope. While the previous year's Force Awakens felt like an end of year compilation video cherry picking ideas from the original trilogy in the hopes nostalgia would blind viewers to its flaws, Rogue One, which equally relies on original trilogy nostalgia, does at least feel like it's showing us something different. Something we'd wanted to see on screen for a very long time but would have had to rely on comics and novels to actually articulate. You know, the world created by George Lucas beyond those dozen characters created by him. Also, the people in this movie can act. The number of major acting award nominees and winners in this film gives Rogue One the most celebrated cast of any Star Wars film to date. 
Rogue One is the most grounded with very little fantasy, and so the acting is also relatively natural. Well, it's as natural as you can get a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Rogue One, however you spell it or more commonly misspell it, is still about major stakes. It mixes action adventure with some human drama. It is constrained by its place in the story, but it's still so much fun that I have no problem of thinking of it as a sort of de facto part of the original trilogy, despite the mathematical conundrum. There are some weird issues, particularly by the time we get to Scarif, where there's some uh, really weird logic in order to make things exciting and happening. But at the same time, it's so breezy and fun that you don't care. That was only an inkling of its destructive potential. I will tell him that I will be taking control over the weapon I first spoke of years ago, effective immediately. Prequels can be fraught with danger. You have to make it feel like it's something new, while at the same time not changing things too much to scare off fans of the original. Which is why Uncle Reg's used car dealership only sells Jaguars without working batteries. I've got a bad feeling about it. Hey. Quiet. What? Rogue One was an expensive film, one of the most expensive ever made at the time, and even without the Skywalkers to lean on, it still made a billion dollars at the worldwide box office. The question was, was a billion enough for Disney when Force Awakens had made double that a year earlier? 18 months after Rogue One, another Star Wars side story was released, Solo A Star Wars Story. Shh, grown-ups are talking. But unlike Rogue One, that film would find a very different reception. Consensus on movies can change over time, you know, a majority of opinions can shift. But Rogue One to date has been the Disney film where an overall, but not universal, positive opinion of the movie has been fairly stable in the wake of some very polarizing takes on other Disney Star Wars feature films and projects. Disney would later pivot some of their major Star Wars projects to streaming, with varying results. The Good, The Bad and The Book of Boba. And then a prequel to Rogue One came out and turned out to be not just good or great, but a proper thriller series that wasn't full of fan service. Also, Lucasfilm, please read my submission for a limited series about a Star Wars Galaxy detective, Nian Numbo. Does he look like a killer? Rogue One has some of the very best action sequences of any Star Wars film. The screen can get very busy with all the pew pew pew, but Rogue One does an admirable job of keeping the action scenes readable, something that other Star Wars films around this time did not do half as well. While Disney currently has a better strike rate on television, Rogue One can hold its head up high as one of the best Star Wars movies of the entire series. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.